right. Our topic for today, one of them, is entitled Devout Christians, Liberty Isn't License. And it begins by talking about that a lot of words, phrases, and expressions are taken out of context in this generation. And the writer says that the word freedom must be at the very top of them. But he gives a number of other words that the world and, unfortunately, even Christians misuse, like grace, love, peace, and goodness. How how is grace misused? Well, the great lengths to redefine um, for for selfish pur- purposes. Exactly. You know, and, as as I read this article, it, it kind of fits well with with what's gone on in our family this week. We we got grand grandsons over, and they brought me a book. This says what I love about Grandpa. And they gave 50 reasons, and number 29 is we value your advice about Jesus. And number 35, thanks for helping us learn about Jesus. It is so important that when we use our use a lot of the words of love and peace and goodness, that we now redefine them. But, you know, it's another generation that we're bringing up. Yes, in this generation, they will go into unrepentant relationships because they love one another. Well, that's not the love that the Bible is talking about, is it? Right. Yeah. And, and that's why it's so important that we we get our children and grandchildren into Sunday school, BBS, coming to church on a Sunday morning. Yeah, to to learn the proper meanings of these words. Now, the the one word that this one does is the word freedom. He thinks that we have misused the word freedom. What's he talking about? Well, how often that it's within the house that can can be the damage of most. Most of the story that he recalls is uh, Hophni and Phineas, who were the sons of uh, Eli, and uh, they would abuse authority and calling on God's judgment against them and their father Eli. It, it's a, a it's an amazing story when you read in Samuel about this, how they were quote kind of spoiled and that. Would, you know, I was going to say not brought up, but but they they knew something about God's grace. And they use their grace. freedom in a selfish way. Yes, yes. Yeah, that that's the main point that the article is saying here. And um, even after God's incredible display of His strength at the Red Sea, uh, Aaron led the Israelites into error. How do you do that? Well, wasn't that uh, they, they wanted an idol because Moses was delaying coming off of Mount Sinai and they built this golden cap that they could, could worship? I mean, yeah. that's, that's a beautiful story when you read that in Exodus about how he takes them across the Red Sea and and drowns Pharaoh's army, and then yet uh, they get this colonel because Moses is, quote, thinking that he's too late coming down from the mountain. Yes, in fact, uh, the article makes a point. It isn't the outside nations that cause Jerusalem to fall, but the wicked kings of Israel with their idolatrous practices and unrepentant hearts, and that led them into captivity. And that's because they were misusing 
what they consider to be the word freedom. He he quotes at the beginning of the article, First Peter two sixteen. What does that say? Live as people who are free, not using their freedom to cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. That's really a good quote from First Peter, that we are to live as free people, free from the law, but we aren't to use our freedom as a cover-up for evil. And that's what Israel was doing, or was it not? Right. Well, it, it kind of hits home for, for for us as well, is we have this, this freedom of the gospel. We, we are declared free, but what do we use it for? Do we use it for God's purposes, or do we use it for selfish purposes? Yes. In fact, the point is made that many of the failures of Israel, Israel can be attributed to someone feeling that they had the freedom and permission to do what they did. Or as Jeremiah's day says, we are delivered to do these things. But that's not proper freedom, is it? No, rightly applied under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the instruction of scriptures is beautiful. How delightful is it to be free from guilt, condemnation of a past sin, to be at peace with God through the mediation of Christ, and to be filled with joy in service of God of our salvation. So it's freedom being free from our sin and from our wretchedness. Yes, we talked about that oh a couple of issues ago about free from sin. It doesn't mean that we don't sin, but we are free from the consequences of, well, paying for that sin in heaven. And that sin is taken away. That's what forgiveness is all about. So freedom or liberty can be utilized as a license for sin that many in our country are now following. But it is unwarranted men of God to denounce it outright due to the rebellion that lies at the foundation of our sinful nature. This entity wages war against our spirit to lead us to live a life self-pleasing to our own life. And that's what we mean by freedom. And that isn't at all what Paul talks about, does he, in Romans? No. It's interesting, in Romans, uh, God's way is still the best way. And instead of a cloak of false liberty, we are admonished in Romans 13, right at the very end, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make open provisions for the flesh to gratify your desires. So he uses uh, Romans 13, the one that we look so much at the government that, that focuses in at the end of the chapter there about the fact that we should put on on Christ. And, and in fact, in many of Paul's epistles, he's always talking about us putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 5, he talks about, let us be imitators of Christ. Yes, I I like the quotation from Jude. He prophesied that men, quote, would turn the grace of God into lawlessness or immorality. And sadly, we're living in a day where under the redefined cloak of grace, actions, lifestyles, and sin are excusable to so-called believers. Well, we get this in children. They do something wrong. Do they take responsibility for it or what? No, they blame somebody else. Exactly. Yes. That can also be a, a family description of what happened in our day when we were children. 
we would do something wrong and then blame it on our brother or our sister, etc. So we need to ask the question, child of God, who is in your camp? What are we talking about there? Well, what uh, what are you giving your ear to? Uh, have you noticed a slight shift in, in the expression Christianity under the, under this to see you make excuses for things that and wants to write it as sin as suitable under the banner of liberty. And the most expressive is, is the gay rights movement that uh, they claim that God made us that way and it was okay. And the biggest misuse of the word love, of, of what, what is truly loving, for when you read the Bible, Love is, is talking about the sacrifices that Christ made on behalf of us for our sins. Yes, we recently did an article where it said, you know, how can we blame ourselves for the way that we are born? If we're born with inclinations to the gay movement or other such things that are contrary to God's word, then God's made a mistake. And, and therefore, we have the freedom to do those things because that's the way we are born. But actually, freedom means to not do those things so that we are not under the guile of Satan. Adam and Eve had that freedom, didn't they? Right. Yeah. They, they sure did. It kind of reminds me of when a person's in jail for for a crime that they've committed, and then they pay the, pay the price, and they come out, and they are free not to go commit the same crime that they committed before, but freedom to live a life without it. Yes. Yeah, speaking of jail, the other article that you talked about is entitled why we need to differentiate between sinners and evildoers. Now, I don't think a lot of people think along those lines. Is there a okay. distinction between a sinner and an evildoer? Uh, you know, uh, after reading this article, I would definitely say that there is. You know, Romans yes. 3 says, Romans 3, for instance, talks about all of sin and falls short of the glory of God. And every individual has done something wrong and not lived up to God's standard. Sin is the nature of every evil, and we are born into it. Yes. But there is a difference. For example, I like watching FBI files on uh, oh, my computer. And a lot of times they're ending up the story that this was really an evil person because they mm -hmm. do things that sinners alone don't often do. Sinners thin, sin by thought, word, and deed, but an evil person just doesn't have any compassion for someone else. And when they murder someone and do things to them, the uh, announcer often says this was really an evil person. They have no conscience. What does that mean? Well, they they give no second thought to what they're doing. I mean, we're exactly. all born with with, with a conscience. It's, it's, it's overriding it and putting it off to the side. You know, what's interesting here is and one of the reasons I picked up the article is it quotes Proverbs chapter 4, and I figured that one is something that you could explain well. Yeah, it says, For evil people can't sleep until they've done their evil deed for the day. They can't rest until they've caused someone to stumble. They eat the food of wickedness, and drink 
the wine of violence. We know people like that. Maybe we got to know them when we were students. Uh, a lot of them are bullies. What do we mean by a bully? Bully. Well, it's somebody who, who causes pain and suffering of someone that's much weaker than them or disadvantaged. Yes. So this is the task of a pastor, not to confuse the daily sins of his membership with unique acts of evil. And he needs to keep a discernment between those two because the scripture has encouraged us to reject every kind of evil. That's first Thessalonians chapter five. So we should not pretend that we do not know that there are various kinds of evils in our societies today that even outspoken Christians are embracing. Now, I don't consider them really to be Christians. They say they're Christians because they belong to a Christian church. But what's really happening here is they are embracing evil and sin as a way of life, and they are not repentant of it. It seems to me that's a way of telling the difference between a sinner and an evildoer. An evildoer does not repent of his sin. A Christian does repent. And what does it mean that a Christian repents? Well, repent is is, is to turn away from sin and seek, seek uh, what God is seeking. Uh, his, uh, his holy will. Yes, this particular writer, uh, Oscar Amiki Amikena, he lives in Africa. And what does he say that has happened in Africa where evil has invaded the church? It's quite interesting. He said, with witchcraft, demonic prophecies, false teaching fake miracles to draw people away from the living God to worship money, men, and the devil. But, you know, we've got that same sort of thing going on in some of our churches in America. Yes. Yes. That we're practicing these items also. Yeah, I, I can't believe I was, I think, at a doctor's, and I was looking at one of their magazines, and it had, oh, what is that called where they tell your future, depending on what uh, month you were born? School. Yeah, horoscope. horoscope. And I was reading through that, and it was just ridiculous, the things that they were saying. But even Christians kind of look at their horoscope and think that that's how they're going to be able to tell what their future is like. And they trust in that rather than Holy Scripture. Well, you you remember, you remember back uh, that Elka convention when they invited all kinds of manner of people up to the podium that they quote shared the the spiritual realm with Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, etc. And the Wiccan. Oh, and the Wiccan. And how do you describe the Wiccan? We, they're kind of the witchcraft of druids and things of that nature. Yes. And their whole point was, as long as you believe there's a God, it doesn't matter how you believe in him. What counts is that you believe in him. And there they were taking a Reformation principle of saved by faith and misusing the word faith. Because when the Bible says we're saved by faith, what does it mean? We're saved by faith through grace in our Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly. And, and none of the people they had up on the stage were Christian. And interestingly enough, they, they had rejected the very thing that a pastor brought up about John 14, that we can know Jesus 
you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. To to know God is to know Jesus. Right. What parents need to be aware of is their children or students sometimes are around other people that simply twist the plain meaning of God's moral teaching in Scripture to satisfy their sinful desires. And so many are promoting all sorts of sexual perversions, all in the name of tolerance, acceptance, and we can also add now freedom. Right. Well, the devil is always trying to deceive God's people. It was true, as you pointed out, since the beginning. Yes. Uh, James 4-7 says that when people gather together to promote sin and recruit others to sin against God, we need to understand that that is the devil at work and resist to him. And that's what I think is a real problem in many churches today, that there is not resistance against the sins of perversion. A lot of pastors don't like bringing them up because they're afraid it will divide the congregation into different camps. And so they're just silent when it comes to the law. But the law is very good because, as Paul says, apart from the law, I would not have known that I sin. And when you don't know you sin, then there's no need for a Savior. Right. And it's a, it, we're back to the very beginning of what we talked about. And it's so important to take our children and our grandchildren to church, to Sunday school, to vacation Bible school, so that they know the difference between right and wrong, the law and the gospel. Yes. Uh, in, in other words, we train a child in the way that they should go. And it's interesting to note in that Bible verse that in Proverbs talks about bringing a child up. What the word used in the Hebrew is the word where they dedicate the altar in the temple, where they dedicate the temple itself, and where they dedicate the walls of Jerusalem to the glory of God. That's what it means to bring a child up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We dedicate the child properly. Well, what woman prayed for a child and gave the child uh, to the spiritual realm to take care of? Yeah, that brings us back to the story of uh, Hophni and Phineas, that it was Hannah who had a child, and that child was Samuel. And she dedicated the child to, to, to the Lord, and he went to work under Eli the, the prophet. So Eli himself could not control his own sons. Uh, they were having all kinds of terrible things doing with the women in the temples, etc. And they didn't think much of it. But this is what these emails were looking at. We need to understand the proper use of freedom and the proper use of a sinner from an evildoer. I'm Pastor Tom Baker, and you've been listening to me and Wes Reimnitz. Next Thursday, we'll have some more subjects to talk about, as we will tomorrow on Law and Gospel. Until then, God bless you. Listen to Law and Gospel each weekday morning at 9.30 on KFUO. For a tax-deductible gift to Law and Gospel, please make your check out to Law and Gospel and mail to Law and Gospel P.O. Box 28910, St. Louis, Missouri, 63132, or call toll-free 1-877-267-1962.
Views and opinions expressed on Worldwide KFUO may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. If you'd like to comment on programs or topics heard on Worldwide KFUO, write us at KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. You can also leave a question or comment on our comment line at 314-996-1542. We are the messenger of good news, Worldwide KFUO.